I didn't know that whether I would be stopped at the border, so I only have a backpack and a handheld suitcase. I didn't even like get my large suitcase. Remember Nathan? He's the ambitious twenty-something pro-democracy activist and politician with two rescue cats. In late June 2020, he was at the airport in Hong Kong, trying to look inconspicuous as he waited to clear security. He was about to attempt to flee to the UK. I was definitely nervous because, of course, they have blacklist, and you could really see that a lot of Hong Kong activists are being arrested with their passport being confiscated, so that they are unable to leave. Beijing's national security law was due to come into effect. All of his pro-democracy activism work was about to become illegal. I could be locked in jail for years or decades, given that the maximum penalty of the national security law is life imprisonment. Captain Crook, prepare for takeoff. But somehow, immigration let him through. Before long, he was in the air. I looked back to the cityscape of Hong Kong under the night field, and it was so gorgeous. It was probably one of the very last moments that captured Hong Kong in my mind. What were you thinking when you were looking at that cityscape in Hong Kong? I mean, it is beautiful at night, the lights, and you can see the shape of the, the islands. The first emotion would definitely be a sense of grief when you witness such a beautiful and wonderful city being dismantled by this terrible regime just for their obsession on power and obsession on total control. People you know that they will face imprisonment and a lot of different consequences. You realize that you are saying goodbye to a place that you have fought for for a very long time. And um, all the things in Hong Kong are so unique that it's just impossible to be replicated from elsewhere. The grief was mixed in with regret. Nathan couldn't warn his family he was leaving. It was just too dangerous. He couldn't risk alerting the authorities to his plans. And Beijing often punishes the families of activists. So I decided not to tell them. It's difficult that I was deprived of um, a chance to say a proper goodbye, but I, I guess that's what I could do to serve their best interest. To avoid arousing any suspicion, he left behind all his belongings. He allowed himself just one memento. It was from Demasisto, the pro-democracy political party he set up with fellow activists Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow. You may have heard of them. They have both since spent time in jail. I brought a flag produced by Demosisto, and it says that 100% freedom. So it reminds me where I'm from and reminding me about the advocacy in Hong Kong. He made it safely to London. His exile had begun. Days later, on June 30th, 2020, the national security law came into effect. Nathan's Demasisto flag was now illegal, along with anything else that could be considered critical of the Chinese government. This is the story of what happened next. I forewarn those radicals not to attempt to violate this law because the consequences are very serious. People are being arrested and journalists are being oppressed. The threat is very real. You never know who will report you, who will denounce you. Such a beautiful and wonderful city being dismantled by this terrible regime just for their obsession on power, total control. It was traumatic. A lot of people were scarred by that. And I was one of them. For those who tasted police brutality, for those who sniffed tear gas, they will come back and people will rise again in the future. I'm Sophia Yan, China correspondent for The Daily Telegraph. And you're listening to Hong Kong Silenced, a show about a city turned upside down. P. 
People often talk about Hong Kong's unique way of life. Until very recently, residents could hold a demonstration, publish an article that criticized the government, and post what they liked on social media. That might seem pretty ordinary to many of you, but in China, it's unique. In Hong Kong, those freedoms were guaranteed by a special governance setup known as One Country, Two Systems. It dates back to July 1st, 1997, when Britain handed the colony of Hong Kong back to China in a pomp-filled day of ceremony. One country, two systems does what it says on the tin. It means Hong Kong is politically part of China, but Beijing agreed the territory could be semi-autonomous for 50 years after the handover, as a sort of transition period. One country, two systems was the result of years of campaigning during the 1980s involving people such as Albert Ho, a lawyer, politician, and pro-democracy icon. We came up with the proposal that Hong Kong, when we unify with China, we should be given a high degree of autonomy and also democratic system rooted in Hong Kong so as enable us to maintain a separate system, of social and economic, as well as legal system to sustain Hong Kong in its present form. The handover also included a vague promise of universal suffrage at some point, something never granted under the British. The whole thing was enshrined in Hong Kong's mini-constitution, the Basic Law. So July 1st, the anniversary of the British handover, is a national holiday in Hong Kong. Usually there are marches and demonstrations, a way for Hong Kongers to show they won't let their unique freedoms go without a fight. But on July 1st in 2020, things were different. It was the first day the national security law was in place and the streets were filled with riot officers ready to arrest any protesters. Beijing had published the law overnight and no one really knew what was in it or who would be targeted. Albert Ho again. None of the government officials were able to give us some brief idea as to what it was about, what sort of contents did it contain, you know, uh, before it was formally prophesied. Albert is a veteran of the pro-democracy movement. He's now 69 and still going strong. He spoke to me from an office piled high with papers and books. This is not a man easing into a quiet retirement. Now, that law, although it's not very bulky, but at least it contains quite a lot of sections. You know, the four categories of national security crimes, okay? Uh, They were entirely new to Hong Kong. Those four new categories of national security crimes were very familiar to anyone in China, however. Secession, or any kind of support for independence. Subversion, aka undermining Beijing's authority. Terrorism, covering almost any sort of violence or intimidation. Collusion, i.e. with foreign forces, potentially including speaking to me for this podcast. Put together, these four categories of crimes were so broad they could be used to prosecute anyone for anything. And technically, they applied anywhere in the world. It's something I've seen used regularly by Beijing against anyone that the Chinese Communist Party classifies as an enemy. Some people had predicted it would be bad. Nathan Law was so worried he had fled the country but it still came as a massive blow. Remember Ted Huey, the politician who was pepper sprayed by police many times? He was taken aback when he realized what the law contained. It was to the extreme. I personally couldn't expect that. It also confers the power to intervene into judicial matters. So the chief executive was given power to select judges to listen to particular cases and exclude uh, more liberal judges. And also it amended the very basic uh, common law principles, for example, the presumption uh, of innocence. 
the law went well beyond tackling the unrest of 2019. For those in the pro-democracy camp, it threatened to end Hong Kong's unique way of life. For others, however, the law was a way of saving it. I think it's all positive for Hong Kong. That's Regina Ip, one of the most prominent pro-Beijing politicians in Hong Kong. She was part of the camp that saw the 2019 protests as a disaster for the city. It was quite scary. We were all scared of going out during weekends. So now we are, most of us are happy that law and order have been restored. That's our perspective. For many of us, it's not a, a fight for freedom or democracy. It was just a violent insurgency. So it's very important. I mean, Beijing cannot allow Hong Kong to be a security risk to China. You know, we are a very important city at the Southern Gateway. If we become, you know, a no holds barred venue for espionage or other subversive activities against China, one country, two systems cannot continue. There are always trade offs between individual freedoms and legislation that protect societal order and national security. That is well recognized in international conventions on uh, civil and political rights, you know. These rights are never absolute. The pro-Beijing camp argued that restoring order via the national security law was the best way to protect one country, two systems. The pro-democracy camp said the law was destroying it. Ted Hui again. Of course, now we, we know it's a lie. It's Beijing ruling Hong Kong directly. We don't have any autonomy. That was the last freedom that we had. It's been taken away. It's confirmation that Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore. So what did all of this mean on the ground? Well, this is the sound of one of the first pro-democracy protests to be held after the national security law came in. And you might notice that, well, there's not much to hear compared to previous protests. That's because all the usual chants, remember, five demands and not one less, they were now illegal. Even signs with protest slogans were outlawed. Undeterred, around 100 people gathered in a mall for a silent protest. Instead of placards, they held up blank pieces of paper. But even that was no longer allowed. Police shut it down and arrested eight people aged between 17 and 68. It was a powerful sign of just how little freedom of speech Hong Kongers had under this new law. All over the city, restaurants, shops, taxis quickly removed any posters or stickers that proved they were yellow, the color associated with a pro-democracy movement. At home, people raked over their social media accounts and deleted any statuses about the protests, any pictures of graffiti slogans, any posts by activists they had reshared. Libraries rushed to remove books by prominent pro-democracy authors. Not everyone was worried. The pro-Beijing camp felt the exact opposite. They valued security and stability over democracy. People like Mr. and Mrs. Liang, who are in their 50s. I think the national security law is effective. It was very chaotic in 2019. My friends and I are as happy to have the law as if we were celebrating Chinese New Year. Finally, things can be controlled. I don't need to be afraid of being beaten on the streets. I can walk freely. I feel very happy, really. If the law can make the city prosperous and stable, I strongly support it. Many countries have national security laws, so Hong Kong is not unique. Plus, I think the law will not have any effect on ordinary citizens. I can still continue to live my life as normal. I would say it's the protesters who brought on this law. I think if society had not been in chaos, Beijing would not have imposed it. But many Hong Kongers took a different view. If 
you were normal people, regular people, you would know that was a law to stop the protests. It was a law to stop people talking. That's Sarah again, the 20-something who lives with her mom and sister and regularly went to the protests in summer 2019. For her and many others, the law could only mean one thing. I knew that like Hong Kong would slowly become just a regular, nothing special city in China. Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, tried to play the law down. It will only target an extremely small minority of people who have breached the law, while the life and property, basic rights and freedoms of the overwhelming majority of Hong Kong residents will be protected. So some pro-democracy activists hoped things might continue more or less as normal. Hong Kong was soon due to hold elections for LegCo, the city's parliament. The pro-democracy camp held primaries to pick its best candidates. 600,000 people voted. Within days, the government said this basic exercise in democracy was at risk of violating the national security law. Sarah was disgusted. When it happened, it was like, oh, you're just going to do things dirty, right? You're just going to, like, pin this crime on them, right? Even anything that doesn't go their way, it would be deemed illegal. Shortly after that, the LegCo election was postponed altogether. The government cited COVID concerns, but no one was fooled. Any platform for opposition was disappearing. Hong Kong was slowly being silenced. And things were about to get worse. Coming up after the break. I remember that day. I was working on a video about his arrest, and it was pretty surreal to see that it all happened in broad daylight like that. A lot of people hadn't seen anything like that happen before. Don't go away. Hi, my name's Theodora Leloudis. I'm the Telegraph's podcast editor, which means I pretty much get to listen to things like the show you're listening to all day on work time. But it also means that I get to commission podcasts like Hong Kong Silence, shows which shine a light on human rights issues and very real threats to democracy. And putting together shows like this one takes a team of journalists, and that's where our subscribers come in. Without their support, we wouldn't have the funds to make journalism like this. To become one of them and to get unlimited access to all of The Telegraph's journalism across print, audio, video and beyond, head to telegraph.co.uk slash silenced, where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online. And after that, it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash silenced, or click on the link in the episode description. I want to rewind for a second to something Sarah said. I knew that like Hong Kong would slowly become just a regular, nothing special city in China. It taps into something key here, that Hong Kongers have long seen themselves as different from the rest of mainland China. To explain why, I turned to Rana Mitter, director of the University of Oxford's China Center. I set him the challenge of explaining modern Hong Kong's history in a minute. Here goes. A barren rock with barely a house upon it. Those were the words of Britain's foreign secretary in 1841, describing an island of fishing villages off the South China coast, Hong Kong. The British had declared war on the Chinese empire for the right to sell opium, and the price of peace was the handover of that island and adjoining land, with more added on a 99-year lease. Hong Kong thrived as a major British imperial port with luxurious mansions and parks with statues of Queen Victoria, contrasting with the jumbled streets where trams and hawkers jostled for space. The communist victory in China's civil war in 1949 led to thousands of refugees fleeing to the city, which became a listening post between Mao's China and the West. By the 1970s, Hong Kong was a hub manufacturing goods for the world, toys, clothes, but it also drew on British rule of law to become a global financial centre. The Hong Kong waiting for the handover to China in 1997 was very far from a barren rock. Hong Kong's unique history has allowed some industries to flourish freely that don't exist in the same way in mainland China, like academia, law, publishing, finance, culture, and independent media. The most obvious difference for journalists between mainland China and Hong Kong is that Hong Kong still enjoys free internet to some extent. 
Whereas in mainland China, to get on Twitter and Facebook, you have to use a VPN. Also, if you work in mainland Chinese media, your work is censored all the time. Tony is a journalist. That's not his real name or even his real voice. We also can't say where he works because he's worried he would lose his job. Let's just say it's a mainstream outlet. He moved from mainland China to Hong Kong a few years ago to work more freely. But during the protests of 2019, he began to observe that things were changing. But there was so much work to do then that I couldn't actually think about anything potentially dangerous to myself, because I was in a very dangerous situation all day, every day. Political oppression was not really at the top of my list. And when did it become closer to the top of your list? I think it was after the national security law was in place, when the Chinese government really started to focus on Hong Kong and tried to change its media landscape completely. The first major assault on free media came just over a month later, on a sweaty, humid morning in August 2020. Without warning, 200 police officers raided the headquarters of the city's most popular pro-democracy newspaper, Apple Daily. This is sound from the actual raid, which was filmed and streamed live on Facebook by staff. Some 10,000 people tuned in to see something unheard of in Hong Kong. Police officers rifling through journalists' desks, removing boxes of files and rounding up staff to check their IDs. Then something even more extraordinary happened. Policemen appeared with the paper's founder and owner, Jimmy Lai. Hong Kong media tycoon Jimmy Lai has been detained. This is the most high-profile arrest yet. Well, Jimmy Lai is a fierce critic of the Chinese state, and his story from rags to riches is well known. As a child, he fled to Hong Kong on board a fishing boat. He went from working in a Hong Kong sweatshop to founding a business empire that is now worth around $1 billion. They had arrested him earlier that morning. In the video, you can see the officers perp-walking Jimmy through his own office, parading him in front of his staff. His arms are handcuffed behind his back, and there are two policemen gripping each elbow. He looked pretty relaxed, but most Hong Kongers were shocked. Just imagine Rupert Murdoch being frog-marched through the newsroom of the Times. You get the idea. I remember that day. I was working on a video about his arrest, and it was pretty surreal to see that it all happened in broad daylight like that. That was a first in Hong Kong, I think. A lot of people hadn't seen anything like that happen before. Jimmy Lai was one of the first titans of the pro-democracy movement to fall. Ever since then, the space for critical journalism in Hong Kong has been shrinking fast. Some of the crackdown on press freedom has been blatant, such as replacing the head of public broadcaster RTHK with a civil servant and prosecuting one of their journalists for investigating police brutality. But a lot of what's happening is more subtle. For example, journalists self-censoring out of fear. Personally, I am trying not to touch on any sensitive political issues right now because... You know, nobody knows for sure what the national security law is going to be or if it's going to affect people's lives in the future. If I say something wrong or if I criticize the government or the mainland Chinese government, will that be a crime in the future? That's still very up in the air. I've experienced firsthand the challenges of reporting in China. For example, putting together this podcast, which focuses on an issue Beijing deems sensitive. I want to bring in the Telegraph's Asia correspondent, Nicola Smith, for a moment here. She's reported on this story a lot, too. Nikki, what kind of changes have you noticed since the national security law has been brought in when it comes to reporting on Hong Kong? One of the first things I noticed was that even on the very day that the national security law was brought in, there was an immediate chilling effect. I remember speaking to sources who were instantly afraid to go on the record. They were just feeling very insecure and very afraid about what the consequences might be. What kind of changes do you think you've had to make to adjust the way you go about reporting? You just have to approach it like you would reporting in China now. I don't see much difference between... Hong Kong and China anymore in terms of journalism. 
you have to assume that calls are being monitored, that your sources, that people are being watched and that you just have to be very careful about how you handle that. And of course, that's much more dangerous for reporters who are on the ground, local reporters who are based in Hong Kong. I think also just for going to Hong Kong, we haven't been able to go for the past year because of the pandemic. But, you know, I I think if I did return, I would definitely wipe my phone and my laptop. And I think the last time I I did that was when I went to North Korea. Yeah, I mean, I have to say for so long, being based in Beijing, being able to go to Hong Kong was always a breath of fresh air. One thing I've really wondered is whether or not we, you and I, the Telegraph, if we've already crossed a red line in our reporting and potentially broken the national security law. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's always a possibility, isn't it? Because the law itself is so vague and deliberately so that I think it's almost designed not only for the general population, but also journalists to think twice about what they do and what they write and to try and introduce this element of self-censorship in a way. So it's definitely very hard to navigate. And I know where all this ends. As a journalist in China, I'm constantly followed while reporting in places like Xinjiang and even Beijing. Plainclothes minders have assaulted me. Touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I'm pretty sure my devices are compromised and the Telegraph's Beijing bureau is bugged. Hong Kong journalists know this kind of treatment is an increasingly likely reality. For Tony and many others like him, it means making some tough life decisions. Most people are not very optimistic about the journalistic landscape in Hong Kong. And to be honest, sometimes I just feel like I need to take a break. I think maybe from a personal perspective, I might just consider leaving this field completely and trying to switch to another job. I just don't think this is very sustainable now because I don't know what the future for journalists is going to be like. With Jimmy Lai arrested, a guy with money, power, contacts, and an international profile, Hong Kongers realized anyone could be next. Then Ted Huey got a knock on the door. My, my wife's quite paranoid because we expected it coming. So she was the first one hearing the knocking of the, on the door. So she asked me, was that the police? And then I also heard the knock. It was 6 a.m. and the pro-democracy politician was in bed. Every time it's more or less uh, that time, 6 or 7 in the morning. And then they would knock on my door and shout it, that open the door or we will break in. It can be quite terrifying when you were asleep and the whole family is with you and with all the kids. Ted had a feeling something like this might happen. He had already been arrested many times for his activism. So when the police came knocking in late August 2020, he was mentally prepared. He had even tried to explain to his kids that at some point, dad might not be around for a while. His son is seven and his daughter is nine. I told them that uh, people want freedom, but the government wouldn't let us have freedom. So if ever they come to arrest your, your dad, so don't be afraid. And because knowing that we're doing the right thing, I simplified the situation like that. And I think they understood very well. The charges were related to a protest in 2019 that didn't involve clashes with the police, so Ted was a bit confused. But at this point, he also knew the exact charges were almost irrelevant. As one of the most outspoken pro-democracy members of LegCo, Hong Kong's parliament, Beijing wanted him silenced. He was released on bail. But the morning police raids, three in total after the national security law came in, were not the only thing he had to contend with as 2020 ground on. I discovered that uh, there are strangers and different people following me and my family almost on a daily basis. I was followed by cars because I drive to work every day. Also, even during my time in Leshko, I discovered there would always be a car around my car in the car park, like four or five men uh, sitting 
doing their own stuff, waiting for something. Ted was not the only pro-democracy figure being harassed and arrested. Everyone was feeling the noose slowly tighten. So a few months later, when the government suddenly disqualified four politicians from LegCo for being quote-unquote unpatriotic, no one was surprised. But Ted and his pro-democracy colleagues decided they had to make a stand. So very quickly, if I remember correctly, we made it clear on the same day or the day after that, there's no point for us to stay in lash codes. And that's why we should all quit together to show our determination. So it was like that. But it, it was shocking. It was heavy. And it involves a really big decision. Together we stand. Together we stand. 19 lawmakers called a press conference and explained that they were resigning en masse to protest their colleagues being disqualified. Every remaining member of the pro-democracy camp in LegCo stood shoulder to shoulder. They joined hands and chanted, Hong Kong add oil. Together we stand. Hong Kong add oil. Hong Kong add oil. Together we stand. Together we stand. Hong Kong add oil. And that was it. There was no longer a single opposition figure left in Hong Kong's parliament. Now, Ted found himself facing a dilemma. Just like Nathan and hundreds of other pro-democracy figures before him, he asked himself, should he stay and risk jail? Or go into exile and fight from abroad? He decided it was time to consider leaving. With various charges hanging over him, he needed a court-approved reason to leave Hong Kong. So he secured permission to go on a work trip to Denmark. He kissed his family goodbye and packed a small bag with official work papers, some clothes, and one emotional keepsake, his daughter's favorite doll. Because uh, it's like my family thing, that whenever I go on business trips and she would just put her favorite dolls into my suitcase, uh, saying that way I can remember them, remember her during my stay. But when he arrived at the airport, people at the check-in desk were instantly suspicious. I presented my invitation letter to the airline. The airline took quite a lot of time, about 40 minutes, until they can contact the authorities in Denmark, approving my boarding of the flight. So I went ahead, passing through customs clearance. At, at the time, I arrived at immig- Hong Kong Immigration. The immigration officers was quite rude to my surprise, because I, I was allowed to leave Hong Kong legally, so granted to leave by the court, but still they stopped me like a criminal, very rudely, and followed me to the interview room in the immigration offices. Next time on Hong Kong Silenced, we'll find out where Ted is now, and... I think it's kind of brainwashing and uh, they force them to believe what the government want them to believe. And I don't want my daughters to grow up in such an environment. Having reshaped the city's political and media landscape, Beijing turns its attention to its next target, Hong Kong's children. You've been listening to Hong Kong Silenced with me, Sophia Yan, China correspondent for The Telegraph. The show was reported by me and Nicola Smith. It was written and produced by Venetia Rainey and produced and sound designed by Leanne Coyle at Whistledown Productions, with additional audio gathering and translation from Jasmine Leong. It was mixed by Tom Brignall. The commissioning editors are Theodora Leloudis and Jess Winch. Follow this feed on your podcast app to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the series, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find this show.